I'm Leslie Green Bowman, president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which has owned and operated Monticello since 1923. I'm standing here in the Monticello dining room, where Jefferson convened friends, family, students, and statesmen for dinners Daniel Webster described as half Virginian, half French style, in good taste and abundance. We are delighted to bring pieces of Monticello to you directly as we share an insider's look at our newest publication, Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, Architecture, Landscape, Collections, Books, Food, Wine. This visually stunning new publication explores Monticello, both the house and plantation, with essays that illuminate Jefferson's contributions to the arts and the culture of a young nation. I'm honored to have had the opportunity to work with Monticello trustee Charlotte Moss to edit this volume. It features thoughtful essays from leaders in their respective fields, including Annette Gordon-Reed, Carla Hayden, Jay McInerney, John Meacham, Xavier Salomon, Gil Schaefer, Alice Waters, and Thomas Waltz. These contributions are paired with exquisite images by renowned art photographer Miguel Flores Viana, who captures Monticello in beautiful and thought-provoking photographs. I recently spoke with Miguel and with award-winning landscape architect Thomas Waltz about their role in this publication and how our culture continues to reflect Jefferson's tastes and deep influence. It's my great pleasure to be having a conversation with a world-renowned art photographer, Miguel Flores Fiana. Miguel is joining us from London. Hi, Miguel. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Beside me is the book that his genius has helped us produce here at Monticello. Um, the title of the book is Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, Architecture, Landscape, Collections, Books, Food, Wine and it was a labor of love for everyone involved. Miguel, uh, tell us a little bit about your love affair with Monticello, which ultimately led to this publication. Yes, of course, um, the love affair begins with Jefferson. I, I, I love the state, the, the, the man, and I admire all his many gifts as a politician, uh, as a statesman, as a diplomat, as an architect, as a garden person, as a botanist, um, and obviously always wanted to see Monticello. However, it took me 20 years to get to Monticello from the time that I moved to the United States. And when I finally saw it in a beautiful fall day, uh, the love affair increased <laughs> by a lot. Um, I really thought that the place is incredible. Um, what he created for himself, that world that he created for himself was totally mesmerizing to me. And um, I came back to Europe very sort of, very much in, not, not only impressed because I had already been impressed, but really sort of thinking of what one could do with Monticello in order to continue to promote what he did uh, in, in that place. So um, I work um, a lot here in Europe with a magazine called Cabana, and Cabana at the time was in the time, in the process of putting together an American issue, and and I suggested, I said actually, there would be there should not be any American issue without Monticello, so that's why I returned the following spring, and I spent two wonderful days with you and everybody that works there, um, sort of going through the rooms and photographing them and going through some of his personal um, uh, objects that belong to him personally. So it was quite wonderful, and, and that's how it all started. I want to say that although this is a book about Jefferson and the arts, it's also an art book in its own right because it features the, um, the extraordinary talent of your eye and your genius with a camera. Um, so I want to thank you for giving us really two art books in one. Talk a little bit about how it, how it was to be up on the mountain at dawn and at daybreak and all over the gardens, the roof. Um, what, what do you remember most about those crazy days when we were trying to uh, juggle you and the public and get the shots you wanted? 
Well, uh, it, it was a little bit unreal in the sense that there were times that I was conscious that I was experiencing things that only the people who lived there one time experienced it. I mean, there were times in which, for example, I was almost on my own in some of the rooms that uh, that he inhabited. And to me, that is an ex that's an amazing gift to be able to see things that way from a very private perspective. I want to come back to the love affair you had for Monticello in your work because it really was the wellspring, the inspiration for this book. When we thought about doing a new book with Rizzoli on Monticello and Jefferson's contributions to the arts, and when you agreed to provide the photography, that really was the moment when we realized we needed your peers in these other fields to provide the text, that only those who were equal to your, um, your status in each of these fields could hold their own with a book with such beautiful artistry. So um, it really has been a love affair for everybody involved, and it was a joy to go to the contributors and ask them if they would write about what Jefferson's contributions in a given field meant to them and their work. And, and you did that visually. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, we were just so amazed and enthralled with some of the beautiful detail shots. You opened eyes uh, to Monticello. Visitors walk by some of these things every day and never see them the way you brought them to life in the book. Thinking about things like that wonderful bonnet of Jefferson's daughter or his personal implements. The, the music. Talk a little bit about how you would go into a room and, and what, what would govern your eye and your selections. Well, um, it, it's twofold. On the one hand, um, you walk into a room and, and you sort of individualize certain things that you believe may be in, important to the room, uh, either a piece of furniture or something on the wall. But uh, what in the end guides me the most is atmosphere. And uh, this is what I try to sort of recreate in the images, try to capture in the images, which is the atmosphere that certain rooms have. And you know, it's, it's not easy um, sometimes when you go to historical places because the person who may have lived there has been gone for a long time and yet, and yet in Monticello, in those early hours uh, of the morning or at the end of the afternoon, you can still capture that. Sort of the man is still somehow floating around. Um, and I don't know if it is the, um, the, I don't know what it is. It's the chemistry of everything. It's the people that work there. It's his voice and his message that comes so strong when it comes to rooms are still there and and I think uh, I I don't know if I capture that properly but I try to do my best. Uh, I also wanted to say that for me it was an extreme honor to be asked to do this because you know he was our third president uh he is you know sort of he's a giant and uh to be able to sort of walk uh behind his footsteps with my camera was an extreme honor and an immense pleasure. And you talk about something we call power of place. I feel it too here, especially in the early mornings before, mm -hmm. um, and before the visitors arrive. You almost feel as though Jefferson's just gone around the corner of the house and you're gonna meet up with him any minute. Um, you, brought that, you brought that power of place to these photographs that you took one of the details that you shot that I find so compelling is a detail about the other inhabitants of Monticello. So Jefferson, of course, lives here with his family in the manor house, but there are at any one moment 130, 140 human beings that are enslaved by him who are making Monticello possible. And and one of those shots, and I just, I just would love to have you tell me what it was like to, to take that shot, is a brick with the fingerprints of a child, an enslaved child, who was helping to make the bricks for the house. It's very powerful, and it's almost like, 
it's almost like the stroke of a painter, you know what I mean? It's, there is, they, almost like time doesn't exist when you are faced with things like that, because that child left the imprint, the imprint dried, and there you're looking at it, and there's, nobody has polished it, nobody has done anything to, to make it look better, it's just the way it was, and there's something incredibly powerful about that. Um, and incredibly human too, because it sort of, in a way, makes you face the reality of Monticello. So in a way, that hand, that imprint, represents all the people who worked and toiled there for many years, uh, making the place, first of all, come to be and then to, to sort of flourish the way it did. That's right. They, they are responsible for the beauty of Monticello. Jefferson designed it, he conceived it, but without his enslaved carpenters, without the enslaved gardeners, without the enslaved chefs, without um, the assistance of this enormous number of people, um, Monticello wouldn't exist, nor would, he, um, nor would he have had the time to conceive of all these things that he did in his lifetime. Annette Gordon-Reed in her introduction talks about the fact that when, um, with the help of enslaved people, he could accomplish so much more. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think this so book is, is really, a, it's a testament not merely to Jefferson's eye and his aesthetics and his contributions, but, but really to so many um, individuals. We know some of their names, regrettably not all, um, who made this beauty possible. Miguel, do you have a favorite room at Monticello? There are many. Um, the one that I keep on sort of thinking about, because to me it was a revelation, and it was a revelation almost at the end of the third week of shooting, or the third time that I went back to Monticello to shoot. And it may seem obvious, but for me it's a, it was a revelation for different things. It's, and it's the parlor. And, um, and let me explain why. So um, I had seen in, in America many sort of colonial historical houses. You know, I used to live in New York, so I've seen quite a few up the Hudson Valley, and then I've seen some in, in the Virginia, uh, in, in the state of Virginia as well. And there is a certain um, stiffness to the way those houses were sort of furnished. Um, most of them sort of furnished with um, uh, American furniture that came from different places, Boston or, or, or um, Philadelphia. And one doesn't get that feeling when one is in Monticello. Monticello is not a stiff place in terms of design. It feels like provided you add a few things, anybody could move in and feel totally comfortable even today. And it was only when um, I shot the parlor that I understood why. So I left the parlor be, uh, to shoot for last because I wanted to see how the light worked throughout the day there. And, um, and while shooting it, I, I, I realized, or I think this is my explanation, why the house does not feel stiff. And, and it, it is because it's even because at the time he furnishes that room with things that had come from France, from the United States, and even something that was um, designed w uh, uh, using a Mexican chair as an inspiration. So there's a certain sort of organicity. This is quite organic in a way. It's a grand room, but it's quite organic and it's quite relaxed. And if I may say so, it's almost like that you could say that Jefferson was in a way a little bit of a bohemian in the way he put those rooms together. Um, and so he was a sort of bohemian ahead of his time. So the house doesn't feel stiff. The, the house feels completely relaxed to me. And it seems like a little cabinet of curiosities, room after room. And I guess that's the reason to me why the parlor is interesting, because to me the parlor in, in a way encapsulates that whole philosophy. Um, that he sort of displayed throughout all the rooms in the house. So you were working with the light, which is always challenging. You were working in a house that never closes. Um, you were working odd hours to capture the rooms without our visitors. 
and you, you shot hundreds of pictures in very few days. I think you came three times, mm -hmm. and each time only for about three, three four days. Mm -hmm. And in order for the book to have, I think, the almost hundred images it does, I, I can only imagine there were at least four or five hundred images that you shot, because I remember looking through them all, and we were, you know, um, so excited about which ones to, to choose. And, and then what made it so incredibly spectacular is the way in which you assembled these images as a, as a walk through the house. And, and, and it was, again, you were giving the visitor your sense of love as you came through these rooms. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember you in the hall, particularly, um, and the light coming through, and the antlers, as you said, and the map, and then the um, antique sculpture of Ariadne all coming together in that beautiful light. Yeah, I, I to, to me, uh, um, besides taking the picture, sometimes because I have been a magazine editor, I often try to think of what would make whoever is looking at those pages understand what they're looking at because it's it's very easy to just make amazing pictures but it, you should help the reader see where he is or where he's going um so i tried to think that way that i was gonna it was sort of the that this the the book should somehow have the feel of someone who goes through the house for the first time seeing room after room and um i think we sort of follow the 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 guy, the, the tour of Monticello, because you, from the entrance hall, you, you go to his library and then to, um, to his uh, study and then the bedroom. So, so, um, and the other thing that I have to say that for me was an incredible re revelation is that I, um, I knew that you were going to have, um, essays. And I remember going for the third time and I remember we met for, for, for dinner before I started shooting that third sort of week that I was there. Um, and I was amazed at the essays because they were so beautiful and so well informed. And, um, and when the book came together, in, it's the first time I've done a book that is just not only images. I love the fact that how the essay and the images have sort of, in a way, sort of now intertwined and made sort of created one single voice. And to be honest, now I think I want to do books like that to get someone to write, you know, amazing text and you illustrate it. Because it was really, for me, it was a discovery. And I, I, I have to say that I, I, I loved it. It was, it's really great. It, it, um, I think that and the people at Rizzoli were so, so sort of, so, so helpful and sort of making me understand how things work when you work that way. You know, I was just used to books where you have like one image per page and you say, well, no, sometimes, you know, we're going to have different things, but I think it worked out and I think it looks, I think, I mean, if I may say so, I think the book turned out quite okay. Oh uh, my goodness. It's so much more than okay. Mm -hmm. Miguel, is there anything you'd like me to ask you that I haven't or that you'd like to talk about? All projects like this are a collaboration, but you guys gave me access to everything. I mean, it was unbelievable to be able to go um, to those rooms. I don't, I'm going to use the word storage, but that sounds too sacrilegious. And to say, look at around and, and say, what is that? And they would tell me exactly what it is and what is that? And then to be able to select those things and bring them to photograph them in the same way that how you got that beautiful tombstone out of an exhibition in Richmond. Um, it was um, it was really amazing. It was because uh, you you sort of you guys gave it your all sort of thing, and it 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 was it was a very satisfying experience. And and I'm glad you guys are happy with the book, and I'm glad the other authors are happy. And 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 for me. It's, a real honor. And on top of that, it's just the most beautiful place. Well, thank you, Miguel. I think it's the most beautiful art book ever done on Monticello. And I'm honored to have my name associated with it. And one of the greatest pleasures of all is just getting to know you and, and getting to see the genius of your work. Miguel Flores Viana, thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you to everybody at Monticello. And I hope to be back here sometime soon. Thank you.
It is my delight to welcome you to the east front of Monticello and meet my friend Thomas Waltz. Hello, Leslie. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. It's wonderful to <laughs> so be here. So you. you have been part of just this extraordinary venture where we asked luminaries like you um, in different fields in which Thomas Jefferson excelled to talk about Jefferson and his influence collectively on the arts. And we're thrilled the book has come out. And I can't thank you enough for writing on landscape. And I loved your conclusion, which I had never thought about, that Jefferson was actually pioneering in your field. Absolutely. It was uh, part of the great pleasure of accepting this challenge <laughs> of trying to offer some, some new glimpse into someone who is perhaps uh, the subject of more scholarship than anyone in our country the degree to which Jefferson had envisioned a complete and holistic landscape was very exciting to me because too often we talk about Jefferson as a farmer, Jefferson as a gardener, but rarely is he presented as a holistic thinker about the, um, the very complex, thriving landscape that was created at Monticello. You brought such insights into that. I, I confess to having aha moments myself. And I love the way you pulled it all together and showed us how he had a comprehensive vision for this landscape, which was on par with no one else at this time? Uh, not that I know of. And I, I think his ability to understand that the landscape is a bearer of meaning, that he is revealing content, he is telling you a story, he is building his own narrative, and he is exploring the nation of ideas that he was trying to create through his work in the landscape. So I think um, uh, the, the circumnavigation of the Little Mountain is one of the most extraordinary things that he, that he designed here. And for that era, the prowess in civil engineering, the understanding of grading and topography but interweaving that with a very intentional narrative mm -hmm. of agriculture, of wilderness, of the, uh, the tended wild. Mm -hmm. I would the say, tended the wild. Um, all of these are emotional landscape experiences that he is orchestrating and creating while interwoven with the functional needs of the mountaintop. Yeah. I think people forget that this was a plantation, a slave plantation. Absolutely. And everything had to be organized and considered. Oh, but there is this root of labor that connected water to the house. Rather than a staircase or a straight route, this, this giant elliptical curve is really part of what connected life and, and the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the curious things that Andrea Wolf points out in, in her book is that he could have chosen a much more uh, politically significant spot on the route to Richmond or Fredericksburg, right, right. Um, something really adjacent to the river, easier navigation. Um, but this idea of occupying the mountaintop and, and uh, being able to survey the entire landscape, I think, um, was, was a passion for him. And so the, <laughs> the pragmatic things of, is there water, <laughs> um, was kind of down on the list. Well, and I loved um, your mentioning that arc from the North Spring up to Mulberry Row, Mulberry Row being the nucleus of enslaved workers. And rather than make it a purely functional route, he marries utility and beauty. Always. And I think that theme emerges in every essay in this book as, as each of you who treated some aspect, whether wine, food, landscape, collections, architecture. Annette Gordon-Reed in her introduction talks about his ferme orne, marriage of utility and beauty, and it's his laboratory for living idea is always there, mm -hmm. but his aesthetic is governing as well, right? right. Um, and then she talks about something that we must never forget, and I think it's I think it's easier and easier for audiences to, to grapple with it here, which is that the reason he had the time to do all that and think all that, he had at his <laughs> bidding um, at any time 130, 140 human beings who, with animal labor assisting, 
made this mountain flat, right? Could cut those roads, could bring the water. And, and as we talk about bringing greater visibility to the lives, the daily lives of the enslaved people that allowed Monticello to exist. Exactly. I think something like this route of labor becomes a very interesting, mm -hmm. you know, potentially mm -hmm. future restoration project that can tell that story. And I think that authenticity in the landscape is something very important in today's world to connect people to, to allow people to hold hands briefly with history mm -hmm. by standing in and on the authentic places of labor mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. just for one moment uh, uh, cr create a deeper empathy. Mm -hmm. That connection. Uh, that connection. It's, it's essential to not gloss over these landscapes. If we can increase the sense of connectivity between people, culture, and nature, we become stewards not just of ecologies, we become stewards of truer human stories mm -hmm. because we understand them. We have touched a place where we know someone, else, um, someone else's life unfolded. That touches us today. Absolutely. Tended wild. So I wanna pull those words to something you said in your essay where you drew the parallel between Jefferson's um, push and pull with wild nature and my words, not yours, taming it, forming it, shaping it to his vision. And you compared that a bit to what was happening in the colonies as they're shaping self-government and the transition and the tension between anarchy essentially and, and a structured civilization, right? You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, yes. Uh, democracy is messy business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so is the landscape. Yeah. <laughs> and we do have these innate and natural tendencies that might veer towards the chaotic, towards the, the selfish, the individualistic. Mm -hmm. And I think those moments when we see ourselves as essential parts of a thriving ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem, mm -hmm. is when we become our best selves as citizens. And the landscape has so many parallels to that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, we know more and more all the time about the interconnectivity of plants through mycorrhizal fungi, through hyphae in the ground, the incredible networks that sustain a rich and diverse landscape that ultimately sustain our lives. And so seeing uh, uh, elements of the landscape as part of a whole, mm -hmm. I think is very important, uh, a, an important parallel to how we see ourselves as citizens. It takes some self-sacrifice to participate in a democracy if you're doing it right. We can't all be little tiny emperors. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that holi more holistic view, I think is a very healthy, uh, healthy approach. As far as uh, the, uh, the approach to this, landscape, there was a deep respect for nature, but also a very aggressive boldness to something like removing a mountaintop. Yeah. I would not advocate doing that again. <laughs> um, personally, don't think that's the best idea, but it did reveal this magnificent place. Jefferson called Palladio's books his Bible. Maybe no one more than you in the book, at least, understands firsthand Jefferson's love affair with Palladio and Renaissance architecture. You have multiple degrees from the University of Virginia, um, a master's in architecture, a master's in landscape architecture. You studied in Vicenza. You lived five years in that area, studying really the wellspring of what um, Jefferson was doing here. And, and I think it bears reminding everyone that this house that's so familiar to us on the nickel was, in Jefferson's words, the curiosity of the neighborhood. No house had ever looked like this at that time, not even, um, not even in the more urban areas, right? So do you want to talk a little bit about your kindred um, understanding of, the, of this man's love of Italian Renaissance architecture. Yeah, I found the, the audacity of Palladio such an interesting counterpoint to the Baroque and to the, the more emotional. There was suddenly this rational um, architecture rooted in the geometries that structure nature, the human body, mm -hmm. um, these 
ideal proportions, the golden ratio, the golden mean, all of these things that Palladio was building his buildings on, and they carried meaning. Mm -hmm. There was an idea being conveyed through the architecture. Palladio's great innovation was taking the temple front reserved for religious buildings and applying it to a working yes. agricultural building yeah. and saying this is villegiatura, this is the improvement of the human soul through contact with productive agriculture. So uh, thinking about the axial relationships of Monticello uh, to, the, to the east, to Richmond, mm -hmm. um, to the sea view as, mm -hmm. it's, as mm -hmm. it's come to be known from his bedroom that we're looking out at here, to uh, Montalto, this uh, quite uh, pyramidal mountain just, just off the portico, um, to the view to the university that Jefferson was creating. Like in the, in the Palladian uh, rural villas, there were often these connections to a mountain in the distance, to the, um, the grid of the productive fields, and there was this blurring of the line of the pleasure garden to the productive right. garden. Right. And Where I think that's what we see everywhere. And when we look to Mon Alto, which is the higher mountain that actually is in the same very, very ancient mountain range on which Monticello is sited. Mon Alto is Jefferson's high mountain that overlooks his little mountain, Monticello. And he buys it before he's even finished Monticello one. And I think most of our readers probably know there's Monticello one and Monticello two. His life was changed by five years in Paris. He comes back, obviously, and, and changes Monticello, just as probably your views on architecture changed after five years <laughs> in Italy, right? <laughs> Correct. But, but, but he writes to his neighbor who owns Monalto, I want to buy as much of your mountain as can be seen from mine and a hundred yards more. A hundred yards more, right. And isn't this the first view shed protection? At least we know of in America, yes. certainly on the part of a founder. So we clearly, w you don't buy a mountain for more fertile fields. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Um, but it is on the axis, right? right? You're talking about how he's ordering and shaping and composing his vision for the world that he's, that he's developing. Um, talk a little bit about Mon Alto and what he wanted to do up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, he had some, uh, like all of us, uh, we, we travel and we want to find ways uh, to incorporate these marvels that we see in the outside yeah. world into yeah. our daily lives. And sometimes they can be naive, sometimes they're brilliant uh, yeah, and spectacular. Yeah. This fantasy of a, of a cascade coming down that would be visible from uh, the West Portico, uh, there would be this cascade of water down Montalto, which has no springs <laughs> or natural <laughs> flow of Boss, water. Boss, we got a problem. <laughs> I was like, well, a little bit of a problem, but I think uh, reality stepped in and looking out to this spectacular landform uh, must have been a satisfying, yeah. a satisfying thing. Maybe more in, in terms of the Palladian ideal mm -hmm. of connecting viscerally to the forms of the earth. He never got the water course because there was no water, but the Willow Walk. Oh, <laughs> that's <the laughs> we, 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 we exalt <laughs> Jefferson for some things. We do not forgive him for others, and then we, I think, find his humanity sometimes in. Maybe a better idea than a reality, right? Well, the Willow Walk, I think, is a is a uh, is an almost comical example of how many times we've replanted it to try to make it happen <laughs> it without finally happen. just saying he might have gotten this one wrong. <laughs> but your your point about historical accuracy is something that it, you know the the bulk of that I think about all the time. Yeah. Uh, the bulk of our practice is public landscapes. Listen to the gong. Oh, it's so nice. We're listening to the gong on top of the house, which is actually connected to that clock. I'm so That's sorry, Thomas, us. but for, oh, for us it. to be it's able to, to share to that um, on camera is really pretty exciting. The reality of historic, historic sites, sites and the livability of historic sites. We're witnessing it right now. It's a beautiful moment. But it is something I think about a lot as we have been invited to work with many historic landscapes uh, uh, in Europe, Southeast Asia, and the United mm -hmm. States. How do we adapt them to the 21st century realities? 
And one that is constantly on my mind is universal accessibility. It's one of the great tasks ahead. We are dreaming and visioning how this country is going to engage with its 250th birthday in yeah. five years, right? And so, you know, being a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the home of the man who gave this country and 160 countries around the world some part of their founding vision words, um, we think about that and we think about how those words have been interpreted. He didn't mean life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for Native Americans. He didn't mean it for Africans. He didn't mean it for women. Right. But those words have been grabbed and procreated and changed societies here and around the world. And yet, where are we on that arc of the moral universe? And so as we think about the 250th, we're very strongly focused on how we make those words matter more and make more sense here. Yeah. Even yes. as we talk about the rest of the country, we, we hope that what happens at Monticello and the experience here and the tension we hold between slavery and freedom, we hope what we offer here in holding hands with history mm -hmm. will drive conversations and visions on every citizen's part for mm -hmm. the country that we still have not become, right. but we could be. Democracy is always the art of becoming, yeah. it yeah. seems. Thank Great you for to having see you, me. Thomas. Wonderful to see you. I hope you enjoyed my conversations with Thomas and Miguel. My thanks to them and to all our contributors for helping produce this latest volume on Jefferson and his world. As you begin thinking about your holiday shopping, this book is available at the Monticello shop and it will make a lovely addition to any coffee table, nightstand, or bookshelf. As I stand here in this dining room that was once filled with friendship and laughter, I am reminded of Jefferson's whimsical invitation to his friend, Richard Peters, in 1791. Call on me in your turn whenever you come to town, and if it should be about the hour of three, I shall rejoice the more. You will find a bad dinner, a good glass of wine, and a host thankful for your favor. We thank you for your favor and support. Come see us soon. <laughs>